data, how to identify or confirm your industry data. Thank you for joining us. I am Elizabeth Sachs, a senior advisor at the Maryland Department of Labor Licensing and Regulation and responsible for implementation of the EARN Maryland Grant Program. As most of you know, this is the second in a series of three webinars this summer. The three-part series is the first phase in our rollout of the EARN Maryland program. This new law and the $4.5 million behind it will support a new industry-led workforce and economic development strategy through the creation and expansion of strategic industry partnerships across the state. Participation in all three of these webinars will position you well to apply for our forthcoming Earn Maryland Strategic Industry Partnership Planning Grant, which will be out early this fall. If you missed the first webinar, it will be available and is available now on our website, which is www.earn.maryland.gov. All three of our webinars are presented by Lindsay Woolsey of the Woolsey Group. For nearly a decade, Lindsay has studied the policy and program elements of successful industry sector strategies, including engaging industry partners, coordination of programs to support employers and workers, rural economies, career pathways and evaluation, and benchmarking models. She has worked in more than a dozen states, most recently in Colorado, California, and Arizona, and her work includes a variety of industry sectors, including healthcare, manufacturing, energy, technology, agriculture, tourism, and bioscience. But before we begin, I would like to go over a few ground rules for the webinar. All participants are in listen-in mode. To ask a question, please type it into the question box to the right of your screen. We're going to try to review the questions throughout the webinar and pose them to Lindsay at certain breaking points or at a minimum at the end of the presentation. Any questions we cannot address during the webinar, we will send out a question and answer in an email to everyone who's logging in for this presentation. You're free to test the question function right now by introducing yourself with your name and your organization affiliation in the question box. As most of you know, this is a one-hour webinar. Lindsay will present for 35 to 40 minutes, and then we will leave some of the remaining time for any questions that you email to us. We also have some listening and viewing tips for this webinar. If you cannot hear well and you logged in via phone, click on the phone icon. If you logged in via audio, click on the MIC icon and make sure you turn up the volume on your end. And in general, for all of us, let's try to limit background noise, which will help us hear the presentation more clearly. Now I'm very pleased to be able to turn things over to our presenter, Lindsay Woolsey. Great. Thanks so much, Elizabeth. And hi, everyone. It's great to be back um, for part two of our three-part webinar. Um, as Elizabeth said, uh, this is a three-part webinar that you should really consider to be foundational knowledge for how you set up and launch and follow through on strong industry partnerships. And so what we're going to cover today are a couple things. We want to do a quick recap on industry partnerships, the what, the why, the how, and importantly, the training components that come into play with a good industry partnership. But then we want to dive into the data. And we're going to do what I call a run through. Because what you need to do at a later date is probably the walk through. Um, as you know, data is critically important to really understand what is it about our local labor economy that we need to understand in order to focus on those industries that really drive our economy. We're going to answer a few questions like, why more data? In other words, haven't we already done this? We're going to look at what kinds of data are really important. We're also going to discuss the limitations of data, i.e., where it stops, and most importantly, where you take it. And then finally, we're going to get to why it really matters for industry partnerships and accurate training solutions. So let's move on to what we're really talking about here. At the regional labor market level, this is the definition of an industry partnership, a partnership of employers within one industry sector or cluster that work closely with government 
education and training, economic development, labor, and community organizations to focus on the workforce and other competitiveness needs of their industry. These regional partnerships may or may not have support from the state and or federal level. And as I said last time, the reason that last sentence is important is that, as you may know, industry partnerships have existed across the country at the regional labor for decades. And they've existed because they are really grassroots efforts. They exist because workforce development agencies, community colleges, community-based organizations, economic development realize that industry partnerships are a very powerful vehicle for understanding what industry needs in terms of training and in terms of other needs. And that all of those partners have to come together at the table to really address those needs. And so that's where we move on to the next slide, which is really this graphic. So you have to imagine that a good sector or industry partnership is a metaphorical table that everybody convenes around. You want to have all of the partners at the table. You got to have your education partners. You got to have from K through 12 to universities. You've also got to have your community-based organizations that really are already working with worker populations and job seeker populations, perhaps your human service organizations that can really help support job seekers and workers on the way through a training program. Organized labor really matters in certain industries and in certain areas your workforce development, your economic development organizations, there's a lot of stakeholders involved, as you already know, in making sure that industry gets what it needs and job seekers get jobs. Somebody has to be the convener of this. Somebody has to be the organizer because it requires a lot of attention. It requires coordination. It requires facilitation. And it requires pulling together a group of industry members so representatives from your target industry, whether it be healthcare, manufacturing, construction, et cetera, they have to be pulled together in a way that facilitates conversation across those employers. So the difference between industry partnerships and traditional ways of doing business for workforce and colleges and economic development is that you are working with a group of employers from the same industry, not individual employers, on a customer basis. And that's a key difference to remember. Also on the slide, and we won't dive into it completely, but there are some outcomes. The beauty of industry and sector partnerships right now is that we have been at this long enough across the country to actually have some evidence that really points to why this partnership model works for employers and also works for workers. So let's move on. A little bit about today's industry partnerships. They are employer driven. They are regional. That means they're not too big, as in they're not typically statewide, um, and they're not too small, as in they're not neighborhood. <laughs> they have to follow a labor market region, and we're going to get to the definition of that a bit later. Again, they have to be convened by a credible third party. The partnership itself acts as a coordinating body across the multiple stakeholders that need to be involved in a good industry partnership. They work because they create highly customized responses to a target industry's needs. They are not just about workforce training. They are about much more than that. That is a key difference between today's industry partnerships and some traditional sector initiatives of the past. Today's industry partnerships focus on workforce and education needs of an industry's workforce but they also focus on economic development needs. They focus on shared marketing and branding. You name it. You don't quite know what will come out of a good industry partnership until you get into the conversation with employers. Employers are treated as partners, not just customers. And this is a key difference as well between today's industry partnerships and what we traditionally have done. And finally, industry partnerships, in the best cases, they are not a grant program. They are not a short-term training project. They are not a passing fad. They are a long-term partnership. So again, that's why these webinars you should really consider as foundational knowledge for building an industry partnership over the long term. So let's jump to the next slide. I want to be perfectly clear again how they're different. They're different from your local workforce investment board, your regional or city economic development board, 
or even your Chamber of Commerce. Why? Because they focus on one single industry. And those three entities tend to be horizontal, i.e., they focus on multiple industries. The members of your local WIB, of your local Economic Development Board or your chamber come from all different kinds of industries. And therefore, their focus and their activities are different. They're different from an industry association because generally, industry associations are statewide. They can even be national. They focus on a lot of legislative issues um, that the industry may have shared interest in. An industry partnership, again, is regional. It's a bit smaller than likely what an industry association focuses on. And it's different from a community college advisory board because, again, it's not just about education and training. It's about something much bigger. So we'll move on. Once again, sector partnerships or industry partnerships operate all across the country. There are thousands of sector partnerships across many different kinds of industries operating right now. Some states are very proactive about helping to support the development of industry partnerships at the regional or local level, and others aren't. But again, these industry partnerships exist because they exist organically. Um, and so that's something, again, to really remember. So moving on, types of issues that partnerships can address. Shared labor, obviously, is a really big one. Every industry really uh, has to be focusing on how are we developing our workforce. But they can also focus on things like common suppliers and supply chain bottlenecks, shared markets, shared infrastructure, shared technologies. This is where a strong industry partnership really starts to be defined as how are we supporting the multiple facets of a strong industry cluster in a specific region. So moving on, why is workforce training always a central focus of an industry partnership? Because it's always on the minds of business. And you guys know this probably better than anybody. Whenever you talk to an industry member about what are your top priorities, what are your top opportunities, one of the answers inevitably is developing our workforce, getting a high-skilled workforce, getting an accurately skilled workforce. So um, when you think about developing an industry partnership and you think about the training component, you want to think about, well, how is this different from what I've already been doing? And one of the big ones is I typically do customized training for individual employers. The difference with an industry partnership is that you are collectively bringing together employers to understand what is the training that needs to be done. This is a wholesale versus a retail approach, if you want to think of it that way. It is powerful because oftentimes, with very limited resources, whether you're a workforce area or a community college or even economic development that is dealing with employers who have workforce issues, you want to understand what does my industry need in my region in addition to what individual employers might need? Because you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck if you can pull together those needs and create training programs that collectively address those needs as opposed to the one-on-one -on -one customized approach. What level of training are we talking about? All levels. Because every industry has entry, entry skill level needs, uh, uh, middle skill level needs, and advanced skill level needs. But you should know that industry partnerships are a highly effective vehicle for low income and low skilled worker advancement in particular. So moving on, I think that we addressed this last time, so I won't go through each one of these. But you can begin to see that when we're talking about training and education, sometimes it's actually a training solution, such as a training program, um, or such as a career pathway program. But oftentimes, what gets in the way is some other type of bottleneck, some other type of barrier that is not going to be solved by an actual training program. Things like retention issues, things like aligning job descriptions with the actual needed skills so that recruitment bottlenecks are removed for an employer. Um, things like aligning the right supports for job seekers as they're going through training so they get through the training and then have the opportunity to actually apply and get, get a job. So that's something to really think about when you set up industry partnerships and get to the training components of your industry partnership. So moving on, again, like I said, we are very fortunate to be as many decades into the world of industry and sector partnerships as we are nationally right now, because we have some really good evidence that shows 
this is a very powerful approach. The results for employers, things like reductions in turnover, reductions in rework, reductions in customer complaints, things like employers saying, because I am a member of my manufacturing industry partnership, I have actually seen increases in productivity from my workforce. And on the worker side, we see workers who are part of training solutions out of an industry partnership earning more per hour, decreases in poverty. They are actually getting a job within the target sector that they were trained for. Um, and they agree that the program improves their chances for getting a good job. And this includes even a random assignment study, which, as you may know, is a very difficult thing <laughs> to accomplish. Um, but a recent random assignment study, a couple years old now, actually, um, shows that workers earned 18% more over a 24-month period. They were more likely to work. They worked more consistently. And they worked in jobs with higher wages with better benefits. So as far as making the case for industry partnerships, these are the pieces and the numbers that you should think about. So let's move on. There is a life cycle of industry partnerships. What we're going to start with today is the very first piece of that, diving into the data. The other pieces we're going to get into in more depth on our next webinar, webinar number three, which is this Thursday. You want to build buy-in across multiple public systems. You want to identify and agree who is really the natural and best partnership convener in our area for this industry partnership. You want to begin finding the natural leaders in industry. It's not just about listing out a bunch of companies within your target sector. It's about finding the people, the people in that company who are going to be active participants. The launch. The launch really matters. <laughs> you, get, you get one chance. And so we're going to talk about what does that launch meeting or the individual conversations that you have with employers look like. You want to always bring others along, because not everybody shows up to that table at the same time. But you don't want to count them out yet, because they will come along at a certain time. And the follow through is incredibly important. You got to have some early wins. Um, you have to demonstrate that there is some coordination and facilitation behind this industry partnership, so folks feel confident that they are a part of something quite formal. And you want to track progress, because you want to be able to say, this is what we've achieved so far, not only for your current members, but to attract additional members, both on the public program side and the employer side. Finally, you want to keep it going. These things can last for years. And ideally, they change constantly, because a good industry partnership changes as the needs of industry and job seekers change. Every single one looks different, as it should, even within the same sector. A manufacturing partnership in the Baltimore City area is going to look very, very different from a manufacturing partnership in Western Maryland or the Eastern Shore. But there are common elements. And again, in webinar number three, we'll start to see what are some of those core common elements of a good industry partnership. So let's move on. Let's talk more about regions, because this part can get a little messy. How many industry partnerships should one region have? It depends on your region's labor market. You want to ask the question, how many sectors, industry sectors, really drive our local economy? You want to make sure then that once you've kind of identified those three to five or more industries that truly drive our economy, and that's based on number of jobs, it's based on past and projected growth, um, and it's based on a number of the other data elements that we'll get to in a few minutes. When you have selected, we know manufacturing is one of our driving sectors. We know healthcare is one of our driving sectors. We know construction is one of our driving sectors. And wow, we actually have a really powerful emerging bioscience sector that is also producing a lot of jobs. So once you know that, you got to start looking across geopolitical lines to begin coordinating support for those sectors. By geopolitical lines, I mean things like county lines city lines, workforce development jurisdictions, economic development jurisdictions, community college districts. These are all geopolitical lines that to employers, they're kind of arbitrary, right? So you want to start coordinating across those lines. The actual boundaries of a region is going to vary depending on your target industry. 
So if you actually started to trace out what the natural labor market region of your healthcare industry looks like, it's going to cross multiple counties. It's going to be based on things like commuter sheds. It's going to be based on things like concentrations of employers in certain areas. And that's going to look pretty different from, say, your manufacturing partnership. Those lines might look like there's another county over here, um, or there's another workforce area that we need to include. So it, you have to stay pretty flexible. And I call that being flexible around the margins. Regardless of what your labor market region looks like for a target industry, overall the state of Maryland should have multiple healthcare industry partnerships, for example, multiple manufacturing industry partnerships, for example. You get the picture. Why is that? It's because, again, a construction industry partnership in one part of Maryland is going to look pretty different from a construction industry partnership in another part of Maryland because those employers are going to have slightly unique needs. So let's move on. And again, if this looks redundant, <laughs> I'm purposely trying to really be clear about what we define as a region. So again, a labor market region, it is the footprint of an industry. It's concentrations of like companies, it's commuter sheds, it's shared infrastructure. You don't want to go too big, and you don't want to go too small. So again, you have to kind of stay flexible around this. Let's move on. What I'd like to do now is just pause, because I think I talk fast, and that was a lot of information. And so as Elizabeth said, we want to pause throughout this presentation and just get any questions that may have come through. So Elizabeth, I'll, I'll turn to you to see if we have any at this point. Um, yes, we do have one at least, and the question is, would it be possible to apply for organizing or convening funds to cover the cost of organizing an industry partnership? And the short answer is yes. Our planning grant process, which will have a solicitation out by the end of September, is designed to do that. It is designed to provide some very limited seed money for a three-month planning process to help both collect partners look at the data, and do a skills and needs assessment to position that budding partnership to apply for actual training funds next spring. Let me see if we have any other questions. I think that's all at this point. Um, participants should feel free to continue emailing questions. There will be another pause slide as well as time at the end. But I'm going to let Lindsay move on now with her presentation. Great. Thanks, Elizabeth. And that was a, that's a terrific question. I love knowing that um, folks are starting to think about what does it take to actually do the coordination, the convening, the facilitation, because it's a pretty critical element of a strong industry partnership. So we will move on. So we are going to get into the data now. Your data dive is all about choosing a target industry for an industry partnership. Or it could be, for many of you, about confirming and finding out more about a target industry that you've already selected. Because here's what we know. We know that across the state of Maryland and across many different types of organizations that you all represent, you're all at slightly different stages here. There are some very mature industry partnerships already up and running. And in fact, they've been up and running for a number of years in the state of Maryland. That's a good thing. That's a good thing because you have some models to look at. You may be already working with an industry, number one. So the question then is, at what level are you working with that industry? Is it a training program? Is it multiple training programs? Other questions, at what regional scope? Is it just within your workforce area? Or is it across multiple workforce areas? Is it just within a city boundary, a county boundary? Um, an economic development district, you want to begin to assess what is my current scope regionally of how I work with this industry. Am I really looking at the true labor market region? If so, excellent. If not, should I be looking a little bit further beyond, again, some of those geopolitical boundaries 
that we've already talked about. And if I do that, does that mean that there might be some other employers that I need to engage in this conversation or in this program that, I'm, that, I'm, that I have up and running? Are there other public partners, like a neighboring workforce area or a community college, that I need to be partnering with, that I need to bring into the fold of the current work that I have up and running? Some of you may have picked an industry, but you haven't started working with them yet. So, so you're kind of just trying to think about, what is it that I want to do with this industry? <laughs> um, and that's where, again, our next webinar will be really important because you want to ask the right questions from the get-go. So you don't have to do any backtracking and correcting or corrective actions um, as you get into it. Um, some of you may be at a completely clean slate where we actually need some good data, we need to look at it collectively, and we need to explore which are the sectors that really drive our local economy. And if we had to make some collective agreements across programs, again, not just within my individual program, what would we agree are some of the most critical sectors that we should start with? And that's where some of this data dive can be most essential. So we'll move on. And I'm going to go back to regions as if we haven't talked about this enough. <laughs> but here's the deal. If you're going to dive into data, and if you're going to start looking at things like number of jobs within the healthcare sector or um, past growth, um, of a manufacturing sector, you do need a starting place, right? You need to have some kind of regional scope because otherwise you're either going to be looking at your whole state, which isn't going to give you the level of detailed data information you need for your region, um, or you're going to go too small because that happens too. Again, my extreme example is that you're just focusing on a neighborhood initiative. And you're missing out, therefore, on a lot of employers <laughs> that are really representing what the regional labor market is for a certain industry. So one thing to consider is that you just got to start somewhere. You have to pick a regional scope. It might be a county. It might be a workforce area. And then you have to stay flexible around those margins again. Because as you start diving into that data, and as you start talking to your other public partners and some of your employer partners, the real map, the actual map of that industry's labor market region, it's going to shake out. It's going to get clearer. You're going to know pretty quickly that you went too big or that you went too small. And that's the beauty of an industry partnership is that it is an ongoing conversation with employers and with public partners who can give you some of that anecdotal information that the numbers don't necessarily give you. So let's move on. These will look familiar. <laughs> there are some guiding principles of data. You've got to know what it's going to give you, and you've got to know what it's not going to give you. What it gives you is a baseline of real information. What it gives you is a way to prioritize. An important thing to remember because it is a common pitfall, it is a trap that we all fall into, is I don't want to get into the picking winners and losers thing. And I want you to consider and I want to encourage you <laughs> to consider that, in fact, you do need to look at the industry sectors again that are providing the most number of jobs in your area, that are providing good jobs in your area, and you've got to prioritize because with limited resources and limited time, again, you've got to get the biggest bang for your collective buck. And so that does mean targeting and focusing on certain industries. It doesn't mean abandoning every other industry. All of your individual program services from workforce services to, to college services to economic development services. Um, will always serve individual companies just as part of what they do every day. But what the industry partnership model does, it allows you to work with your highest priority, critical industries in your local economy in a really targeted, focused way. Finally, data is a starting place for a conversation. Limitations. No data set is perfect. It never, never is. <laughs> there is usually a lag 
In other words, the data is never quite um, up to speed on what's actually happening. There's always missing data, and sometimes there is way too much data, and you get into analysis paralysis, and you never actually move on to the implementation phase. And finally, the most important thing to remember is that there is no substitute for actual conversations with employers, and that is why industry partnerships are so important, because industry partnerships are an ongoing conversation with employers. Even databases that are real-time databases, such as Burning Glass, um, such as real-time analytics, these are powerful tools to understand current vacancy rates in certain industries and companies, but they are still not a substitute for the real conversations you have to have with employers. So let's move on. And I want to get into actual data points. Here are 10. Here are 10 that I have seen across the country be the most powerful indicators of which target sectors do we need to be working with and prioritizing. You want to look at current employment. You want to look at short-term change, for example. In the past two years, what's been going on? Has there been an uptick? Has there been a downturn? You also want to look at long-term change, and you want to compare those two. You want to look at current and past location quotients. Location quotients, some of you, most of you probably know, but location quotients really represent, do we have any kind of comparative advantage in this industry in our region? It is a number that basically represents, compared to the national average of concentration of companies, let's say, in manufacturing, does our specific region have more of a concentration? So how do we compare? How do we match up in terms of concentration of companies within a sector to the rest of the nation? That tells you something. You want to look at current wages. We're looking for good jobs here, right? So that's important. You want to look at things like the number of establishments. Again, what's the concentration? How many manufacturing firms do we have in our area? How many healthcare providers or related healthcare uh, employment um, hubs do we have? The average number of jobs per establishment, i.e., are we a huge um, you know, healthcare uh, provider uh, sector, or do we have small clinics, things like that. You also want to look at job growth projections. Those should always be taken with a grain of salt, but they're important. And you want to look at occupational data, i.e., what kinds of occupations are we seeing? Where are the most jobs? Um, again, what are the wage and salary levels? This is going to start to get into, obviously, what kind of skills are needed. And then again, there is no substitute for the on-the-ground knowledge. The on-the-ground knowledge comes from employers, and it comes from all of you, too. It comes from workforce areas and economic development agencies and colleges and community-based organizations who have already a re working relationship with industry members. Because you hear things, you know things that the data and the numbers may just not give you. If you don't have all these data points, you work with what you have. But I'm giving you these top 10 because these are the ones I see used across the country the most. So next slide, what do you do with this data? Here's your job. You want to get these data points to interact. I don't recommend doing this alone. I don't recommend that any one individual or even one organization do data dives just by themselves. You want to get all of your partners looking at the same data together because that's where you start having a conversation. That's where you immediately start building buy-in across your programs, across your silos, across your jurisdictions about which industries really matter and should we collectively focus on this one or that one. So this is critically important. So you get everyone in the same room looking at the same data and you discuss. You discuss each data point. You assess which one feels real based on what we already know. You start sharing on the ground knowledge that the data doesn't reflect, and again, you come to some agreement on which industry sectors are really going to matter for us. So next slide. These are the discussion questions that you want to go through. If you can get other folks in the room, other partners and stakeholders looking at the same data, you want to look at that current employment number, say, for your healthcare sector. 
in your region, and you want to say which sectors are the biggest, which ones are the smallest. You want to look at things like short-term change. Has there been an uptick, or has there been rapid declines? What do we know about that? You want to look at the long-term change. Which sectors have added the most jobs in the past decade? Which have the highest long-term growth rates? Then you want to compare both of those. If you have a sector that has a high current employment, has an uptick in the past two years, plus has a high long-term growth rate, well, you've got something there. You don't want to ignore that. So you start looking for things that really stand out to you. Current and past location quotients. Again, if you have a location quotient for, say, manufacturing that is above the number 1, 1 1.0, it means that you are slightly higher than the national average in terms of concentration of companies in that sector in your region. So you do want to pay attention to your high location quotients. You want to pay attention to an industry sector that might show an increase of a location quotient over time. Because that means that there's something that's going on that is making that sector grow faster in your regional economy compared to the national average. There's something there. Again, you want to look at numbers that are just standing out to you. Current wages, obviously. You want to look at the highest and the lowest. You want to compare. You want to discuss. You want to look at which have the strongest combination of high wages and high job growth. Let's move on. Number of current establishments and average number of jobs per establishment. This is yet another cut at understanding what your healthcare sector or your construction sector or any other sector might look like. Which sector shows the largest number of actual firms or companies in your region? And, and how big are those firms? Are they large? Are they small? Are they a really healthy mix? What does this say about the structure of the sector you want to discuss? Look at those projections. Do we think that the healthcare sector is growing, or is it stabilizing and, st and just staying steady? Is there a decline? You want to really start looking at the occupational data at this point. Top occupations in terms of jobs. You want to understand, are there occupations that cross multiple subsectors of an industry? This is particularly important in things like advanced manufacturing, which can be defined in many, many different ways. There are different types of manufacturing, as you know well. You want to understand, what is the data showing in terms of projected new growth versus replacement needs, i.e., retirements that might be coming up? And then you want to start getting into, what do we really know about those skills? that are needed for those certain occupations. And finally, part of your discussion, and again, the reason it's so important and useful to have this conversation across programs and across jurisdictions with, with your partners, is that it's the on-the-ground knowledge that can really bring out some interesting points that make you make final decisions about if we were to collectively focus on a target industry, which ones would, be, would we focus on? What do all the combined inquiries yield, for example? What do we know anecdotally about certain sectors? What's the culture of an industry? And, and here's an interesting point. This really matters when you are about to launch an industry partnership. Because you can get a group of healthcare providers together who are highly competitive. You have to know how to approach that conversation if you are going to facilitate a conversation about what are your common opportunities for growth in our region? What are your needs? It's going to be very different from a conversation with small and mid-sized manufacturers, who sometimes can be very community-oriented and ready to have a conversation. And your problem will actually be, do we have enough time to get everybody's input? If you're convening energy <laughs> partnerships, on the other hand, sometimes those companies are just really used to operating alone and by themselves. And pulling conversation out is going to be difficult. So these things really matter. You also want to think about what's the readiness of this industry to collaborate? What do we know about that? And the only way to answer that question is, I as an individual workforce area have been working with these manufacturers, and here's what I know. I as an economic development director have been working with 
the construction ministry and here's what I know. So these are the types of conversations that you want to have. So moving on, um, we again want to take a pause and just see if there are any questions at this point. So Elizabeth, I'll turn it to you. Okay, here's a question that was identified as a chicken and egg question. Do you pick a region and look at the data, adjusting the regional boundaries as appropriate, or do you use the data to help determine what the region should be? Which comes first? That is such a perfect question. I'm so glad that you're asking that because it's both. <laughs> it, is not, it is not the chicken or the egg. It's the chicken and the egg. This is why you have to stay flexible constantly. I always recommend that you start with the region first. And it depends on how you organize your data. You, know, you could easily start with a workforce area. But the reason it's so important to have maybe your neighboring or adjacent workforce areas in the same room with you when you do your data dive is that they're going to bring in other information that you really need to understand. Um, you could also start at a county level. To a certain extent, you're limited. Um, based on how the data could be organized or put out. But the conversation is going to yield the true labor market region. And you're going to then start diving into, well, we need to understand across that county line or across that workforce area line what's going on in our healthcare sector, what's going on in the manufacturing sector. Oftentimes, what I see happening is this comes from employers, too. So if you do a data dive and you understand that healthcare is one of your top driving sectors for your, I'm just going to stick with workforce area as an example, and you have a few employers in that sector that you already know, have a quick conversation with them. Pick up the phone, go to coffee, and say, we need to truly understand what the shared labor market region is for, this healthcare, for, for, for the healthcare sector. Employers will have this conversation with you. They're going to say, well, look, I know that a lot of our staff, we either lose them <laughs> over the county line, or they come from over the county line, or they're going to this hospital system, um, or this hospital system over there, and this is where they're located. We know that our workers shift back and forth all the time. We know that our patient population shift, over, shift back and forth all the time. That's the information that's going to tell you then, oh, we need to actually extend the definition of our region for this particular industry just based on what so-and-so from a certain healthcare system just told me. So it is a constant kind of reiteration and understanding before you get it right. And industry partnerships, once again, shift all the time. And so you just have to stay on top of that. So the answer to your question is, it has to be both. Um, but you have to start somewhere. And so I recommend picking a definition of a region, looking at that data, and then beginning to have the conversation that will help you expand it. Lindsay, this is Elizabeth. We're getting some questions that are more about the RFP process and other types of things that I can answer, which I will do by email after the presentation. The email answer will go out to the entire group. But I'm going to have you move on with the presentation now. Great. OK. So moving on then, I just want to do a quick simulation. This is one tool that I have seen used. It's a basic spreadsheet. Uh, there are 14 different industries listed out here. This particular set of data is organized by two counties. You can see that there are different data points across the board here. So if you just chose advanced manufacturing, you can see the current employment. You can see the short-term job change for advanced manufacturing. Uh, between 2010 and 2012. You can see the average annual growth. So you get two different versions of that two-year uh, job change. You can also see the 10-year changes from 2002 to 2012. You can see the current average wages, the current number of establishments, the current number of jobs per establishment. And you also get to see the current location quotient as compared to a 2001 location question. So if you scan across these industries, 
you want to just look for numbers that stand out to you. And what's interesting about this is that advanced manufacturing, the first thing you see is the red. You see a decline. You see a decline in jobs. But at the same time, you see that the location quotient is slightly over the average. Um, it's at the average, and then it was slightly over the average in 2001. So this just makes you wonder. It just makes you wonder. And that's, that's all that, that, that you have to do right now is wonder. What does this tell me about my advanced manufacturing sector? So what I'm going to ask is that you jump to the next slide. And I know that these are tiny, and you may not be able to read these. But this is then really taking apart advanced manufacturing within this two-county region by four-digit NAICS codes. And four-digit NAICS codes really just take you down to a pretty medium level of understanding the subsectors that make up advanced manufacturing, for example, in this two-county area. You're going to see things like beverage manufacturing, uh, paint coating and adhesive manufacturing. You're going to see things like animal food manufacturing. Um, you know, you're going to start to understand what types of manufacturing are in our area. So what I do first, just because I'm interested in this, is I again jump to location quotients. What's interesting to me is that there are certain subsectors of manufacturing in this area that have really high location quotients. Um, current location quotients, for example, beverage manufacturing is at 9.9. .9. That is a really high location quotient. And what I can see is that it is really high compared to what it was in 2001. So there's something about our area <laughs> that is making beverage manufacturing jump the scores, really just, just go up. So I'm curious about that, and I want to know more about that. And then I want to look at some other ones. What are some of the other higher location quotients? See things like animal slaughtering and processing. You get an idea of, of what that might mean. You see things um, like leather and, and, and uh, related product manufacturing. You're just getting a really good understanding of what types of manufacturing exist in our area. You also want to discuss, because what we know is that across the country, Manufacturing has had a decline in jobs. And so you want to ask yourself, does that mean that we don't support manufacturing? That's where looking at things like wage levels, number of establishments, actual 2012 employment, and location quotients can help you answer that question. Because if we know that nationally the number of jobs have declined, does that make us ask the question, should we be looking at other things to really understand if manufacturing is still worth supporting? And the answer to the question here is yes. Because in our area, we have some advantages. And the jobs are pretty good. Um, these are higher than average wages for our area. We know that just based on discussion. Um, that really is going to help you understand what is it that we want to know about manufacturing, and should we be collectively focusing on it? Let's go to a different one. But what I'm going to ask you to do is go back to the previous slide. <clears throat> because I also want to focus on healthcare and wellness. And so on the previous slide, a good data conversation. we still really finding that employers within, in that industry are engaged as partners, are really helping us understand what they need? Is this still the right, again, bang for our buck, our collective buck? Um, generally, you're going to find that when you get some early wins, when you get some long-term strategies, these things keep going and going and going. Um, and the I best have one cases, more. Lindsay, I have one more. I don't want to miss. Okay. Uh, I know you have some more material, but this one was really good. Any tips on accessing employer data when it may be proprietary, if, in, if across industry employers for a given sector? 
Yes, that's a great question. You're right. So let's jump to that. So there's always going to be proprietary information, right? Um, and sometimes you're going to be able to access it, and sometimes you're just never going to be able to access it. My advice <laughs> is that, especially when you get employers in the room, do not let your fears about proprietary information stop you from facilitating a good conversation. Let employers make their own choices about what they talk about and what they don't talk about. In some cases, it's perfectly acceptable and a good idea up front as the facilitator or coordinator of a partnership to acknowledge, I know that there's proprietary information um, that we cannot discuss, and I want to respect that. This partnership is about shared opportunities and what we can do together, and you move on from there. What I have seen remarkably across the country is that successful industry partnerships, frankly, never even have to get into some of that proprietary information. Because if you facilitate the conversation the right way around opportunities and shared opportunities and shared collective action, um, suddenly those fears kind of go away. So that's something to really remember. It's another pitfall that I see very, very commonly um, uh, happen, and it kind of stops you in your tracks. So generally, as far as um, concerns from employers, you can ensure them we're not going to get into that. This is about common opportunities um, and common actions. Um, as far as actual data points go, again, you use what you have. You use what you have. And um, another reason why to have this conversation with your partners and other stakeholders in the community is that they know something that you don't know. This isn't about uncovering secret data. Frankly, you probably don't need that data. Um, the data that okay. is available is enough. Uh, Lindsay, we had a request and we had a slight power blip to go back to the slide with some of the data. So I'm back okay. there and I'm hoping you can wrap up some of the data analysis and then we'll move on. Uh, we had a question okay. actually just now about how to calculate the um, location quotient. Well, that's a great question. And so location quotients, this is something that um, there are certain um, our databases that already provide this. Um, EMSI, MZ um, is one, and some of you may have access to that. There are other databases um, that can show location quotients already calculated. Um, and so that's something maybe Elizabeth, that we can send out in an email um, separately. Um, but um, it, it's, a, it's a good question. It's, it's very difficult, honestly, to calculate it from scratch on your own. Um, but there are databases that can be accessed. So um, did we want to go back to the health and wellness slide? Is that what we're on? No, OK. Um, I'm, I'm seeing it move around quite a bit here. So um, we will move on to the what do we get out of this <laughs> conversation. Um, again, this is just to reiterate that data should be a dialogue. Studying the data alone gets you a bunch of numbers. That's the truth. It also gets you one interpretation of the numbers. Organizing a conversation about the data gets you a deeper understanding of your industries. It gets you the anecdotal information from different perspectives that you would not have otherwise had. It already starts to build buy-in and agreement about priorities and where you can enter into collective shared action across stakeholders and programs. It gets you a next step for moving forward together. So let's move on to next steps. Your next steps are twofold. Creating an industry partnership that is an ongoing, sustainable industry partnership that follows the needs of your industry, the data is just the very beginning. Real information comes from employers. And again, an industry partnership, a partnership is an ongoing conversation with employers. But you want to use your industry partnership to understand training needs. On the flip side, you don't want to limit your industry partnership to just workforce and training issues. So the opportunity that Maryland has right now is to get some training out the door that is industry focused per the earned legislation, but also build a broader, deeper industry partnership around that training 
that is going to really sustain into the future and have you have a vehicle for ongoing understanding at a deeper, broader level of what those training needs and other needs might be for that industry. So on the get some training out the door side, <laughs> again, you already are at different stages. And so you have some strong ideas of what training might be needed for certain industries. And that's a really good thing. So you want to build on that. Um, you also want to make sure that you've got some early wins plus some long-term training, training and education strategies in mind. And again, that's where building an industry partnership around what you may already be doing or building an industry partnership from a clean slate perspective is going to get you. So moving on to, to the last slide here. What can you expect as part of Earn Maryland? And Elizabeth, I'll let you comment on this too. One, a data toolkit. So similar to the dashboards that I was going through, um, a data toolkit uh, that really builds on the Maryland workforce dashboard, but that's inclusive of as many of the essential data points that we already discussed as possible, and a do-it-yourself workshop guide for holding that data conversation with your regional partners. That's something that you can expect. We're aiming for mid-September. Why do you want to use it? Because you want to supplement what you already know. You want to find out what you don't know. It is a terrific organizing tool to bring in public partners and other stakeholders that you may not be working with um, at a deep level right now. So again, use it as a buy-in tool to get support and agreement across those stakeholders for your industry-focused efforts. So Elizabeth, any comments on that piece before we move to final questions? Well, just to reiterate, um, with the help of Diane Pavich at the Governor's Workforce Investment Board, we are working to pull together some of the data sets by WIB region that might be useful in this process. Using it is by no means a requirement to apply for a planning grant, but we are looking to be as resourceful for you as possible. And by mid-September, before the planning grant solicitation is released, we will also be announcing how to access this data toolkit and also provide a workshop guide. So continue to visit our website, www.earn.maryland.gov, particularly once September hits for these resources as we roll them out. Lindsay, do you have any more wrap-up um, on this particular webinar about diving into the data? Um, I do not. The only thing that I will say is that, again, in our next webinar, um, I'll pick up on why the data dive is so essential, but how do you use it to then really launch and mobilize an industry partnership? Or I want to mention specifically expand on an existing industry partnership that you may already have up and running or an existing industry-focused effort um, that could be turned into a robust strategic industry partnerships. So tune in for that on Thursday. So thanks everyone for joining us. It is 2 o'clock. This will be archived if you missed any of it. And we look forward to seeing you at the next webinar this Thursday at 1 p.m. Thanks very much. <laughs>